Recording in progress. Recording in progress. Okay. Good morning, Banti. Good morning. Uh, Good morning, Banti. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Question? Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, Bante. Good morning. Good morning, Bante. Good morning. Ah. Oh. Okay. Good morning, Pante. Good morning, good morning. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I don't see a, a question uh, in the chat um, at present, but um, if it's okay, maybe I can make a comment on what we learned yesterday and what we know in terms of neuroscience that I thought might be interesting uh, mm -hmm. to the group. Uh, and what we talked about is the indulgence in sense pleasure. Um, and the interesting thing in neuroscience is that we now know that the part of the brain that's responsible for pleasure and pain is the same uh, part of the brain and um, in, in Dhamma, we learn that um, there is impermanence. So when there is uh, pleasure, uh, it's followed by pain and pain is followed by pleasure. And uh, that is um, also something we learned in uh, neuroscience, that the brain always wants to come back to a level of equilibrium. Uh, it's called homeostasis. So when we experience a lot of pleasure and indulge in sensual pleasure, the dopamine level in the brain drops and it comes back to equilibrium, which means that uh, we experience a, a state of dissatisfaction um, that follows from always indulging in sensual pleasure. So it's something that is also scientifically uh, verified, and um, I thought it's kind of interesting to have a neuroscience point of view in what the, the Buddha taught us, uh, taught so many years ago. I just wanted to mention that um, to open the discussion. Uh, so uh, now we have a, a question in the chat, a um, uh, question from Doug. When we break the precepts, does it call for remorse and shame, or is the best thing to do to recommit with one's whole self daily to the three refugees and lifetime precepts? Uh, didn't the Buddha talk about such recovery in the Conchal Sutta? So the question is, uh, when we break the precepts, what's the attitude that one should have? Uh want uh, when we break the precept yes what ha how should we <clears throat> have remorse and shame or should we recommit ourselves to taking the three refuges and lifetime precepts um, okay uh Yes, when you uh, break any precept, you have to uh, determine 
uh, not to break it anymore uh, anytime in future. Once you have uh, uh, broke, you have broken a precept, then uh, you re determine not to repeat it again. And uh, at that time, uh, repeat that precept again. For instance, uh, if somebody uh, lie, and then later on realize, oh, I I I lied. And it's it's not good. It's very bad for my uh, my mental state. Therefore, I will not do it again. So uh, this is how we uh, call correct ourselves and uh, avoid repeating the same uh, mistake. And then, in addition. One also must uh, uh, be trained to be more mindful and uh, trained to restrain senses uh, so that the person will be more careful in future uh, to avoid for, for avoiding uh, committing such uh, uh, mistakes. That way the person will uh, <coughs> improve uh, and keep doing more and more uh, wholesome things and determine to tell the truth all the time. Uh, if next time if the desire or wish arises to lie, and that time again you have to think, well, I regretted uh, telling lies in the past. Now again this thought comes to my mind. This time I should not utter any false word. Uh, so they correct it and then determine not to commit again. Okay? Yes, Vante. Um... But the, the question also talks about remorse and shame. Um, these are negative emotions. Uh, do they serve any purpose um, or should they, um, one shouldn't dwell on these remorse and shame? Is that correct? Yeah, remorse is the punishment uh, that uh, you receive from your own conscience. Uh, so, you feel very uh, painful, uncomfortable, uh, therefore uh, determine uh, not to do it again so that you will not uh, you, you will not uh, be uh, remorseful. And Buddha said it in Pali, Yoja Pubbe Pamajyutta Pachyaso Napamajyati so Imang Lokam Pabhasyati Abba Muto Chandima, those who have committed offenses in the past, uh, and became because un, uh, unmindful uh, behavior and because of unmindfulness, committed offenses in early part of your life. And then later you determine I uh, committed such and such a mistake. And therefore, now I'm uh, grown. I have uh, determination. I am. I should be more mindful, uh, not to commit it again. So the remorse is the sort of a punishment you get from yourself or from that particular thing. Okay. The the question also asks about the Kanchal Sutta, the Sankha Sutta. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about about uh, the the teachings of this sutta? Um, it's the story about Abhisamdha Kaputta um, that went to talk to the Buddha, and um, uh, he was asking how um, the the Buddha asked him how the Niganda Nataputta taught the Dhamma to his disciples. Do you remember that sutta, the Sankha Sutta? 
uh, Abhiraj Gumara Sutta? Yeah, it's called the Conchal Sutta, Sankha Sutta. What Sutta? Sankha Sutta, Conchal Sutta. It's um in Samyutta Nikaya, the Sankha Sutta. It's spelled S A N K H A Sutta. Sankha Sutta. Sankha Sankha Sutta. Sankha Sutta. Yes. Uh, um, it's the story about when um the um, uh, the Buddha asked uh, uh, how Niganda Nataputta teaches the Dhamma to to his disciples. And um, it's the story about um, basically uh, those who indulge in sensual pleasures and their destination. I don't remember that particular sutta. It's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we can just move to, to the next question. Um, so the next question is, it is stressed that craving leads to becoming and suffering and to, to it is stressed that craving leads to becoming and suffering. Is it is not padana supported by the eightfold path that leads to liberation? So the question is, is it um padana that's supported by the eightfold path leading to liberation? Yes, craving uh, leads to becoming and suffering, yes. Uh, so is it uh, not padhana uh -huh. supported by the eightfold path that leads to liberation? Yes, uh, padhana means uh, uh, virya, in other words, uh, some of padhana. Uh, Yes, uh, that uh, to overcome uh, craving, we have to practice uh, effort, make effort, and understand the danger of craving. Uh, craving includes all kinds of desires, uh, particularly sense desires, uh, desire for various kind of uh, sensual pleasures uh, that Buddha has explained in 10 different similes uh, in order to show the danger of uh, craving or desire. And so we understand in our own life, uh, not from outside, uh, Any time we have craving, we never had peace. Uh, craving always disturbed our mind, uh, and we will we cannot have uh, peace, uh, concentration. Uh, so uh, we have to understand that. That is why when we have right understanding in the noble eightfold path, uh, so. Uh, then we see the, the, uh, the danger of it, Adinava. Uh, surely we can get rid of by the craving by practicing the noble lowest fall path. As I said, the all defilements in our minds uh, can be overcome by following the noble eightfold path. Each step. Uh, deal with uh, our mental, uh, our defilements particularly, and cleanse our mind. And that is why I said uh, the noble light pole path is very powerful karma that destroys all karmas. The practice in noble light pole path is uh, can what can destroy all the karma. Therefore, it is called karma destroying karma. Okay? 
Thank you, Bhante. Um, the next question is in the Unapo Brahmano Sutra, the um, Brahman Upan, uh, Unnava states that minds resort, and, I mean, the Buddha says that minds resort, Brahman is mindfulness. Can you explain what is meant by this sentence, minds resort is mindfulness? Ah, mind resort, minds resort. Yes, is mindfulness. Uh, is mindfulness. Uh, mental uh, the, the accumulation. Uh, we learn uh, through the practice of mindfulness. For instance, when in the clear comprehension, uh, clear comprehension is uh, the feeling, perceptions, and thought. Uh, the person who practice clear comprehension uh, sees uh, the feeling arising and uh, then he attends to the feeling and the feeling then he now sees the feeling passing away. That means he, the feeling arises with awareness and attend to that feeling with awareness and letting it pass with awareness. That means one understands when the feeling arises, uh, whether it arises from the uh, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, uh, contact, uh, contact uh, uh, pleasant uh, object, unpleasant object, or neutral object, if the object is pleasant, pleasant feeling arises. Pleasant feeling has uh, underlying tendency of craving. Uh, if the object is unpleasant, unpleasant feeling arises. Then the underlying tendency is aversion. When the feeling arises from neutral object, uh, neutral feeling arises. Underlying tendency of that is confusion. And also, Pleasant feeling arises from seeing uh, impermanence. Uh, that is uh, uh, what you call niramisa sukha, uh, not uh, mundane, but it is supra mundane, not sensual, but non sensual uh, pleasure related to liberation. If the, if the pain arises from seeing again that somebody has attained liberation and you have not attained it and you are practicing meditation very diligently and yet you have not reached that mental, that state of enlightenment, then you have disappointment. And that disappointment is not sensual but spiritual Again, you see uh, everything is impermanent. Then you will uh, know in the past everything w w was impermanent. Now everything is impermanent. In the future, everything is impermanent. Then there is a equanimous state of mind, and that is not uh, sensual, but uh, spiritual. So we, the person who is mindful, uh, can see the feeling arises from the sources and uh, then uh, perception, uh, sanya, also he knows uh, rupa sanya, sadha sanya and so forth, how it arises, how it remains, how it passes away and uh, thought, volition, sankara is, is arising uh, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, and mundane or uh, non-sensual, uh, spiritual. See, all this is, is in detail when he pays attention. And uh, so uh, mindfulness, this is the part of uh, explanation of clear comprehension. 
it is clear comprehension. Uh, my mindfulness joins this clear comprehension. Therefore, these two words, sati sampajanya, go together. Sati is mindfulness. Sampajanya is clear comprehension. In order to support the mindfulness, clear comprehension arises. And therefore, the person, person's mind uh, has all these uh, resources. Uh, and so he uses them. That's called mind's resort, store uh, 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 field, uh, storeroom, is mindfulness. Okay? Thank you, Bhante. The next question is, uh, it is said that a person should give with their two hands. In other places, it is said that anonymous giving is best. Could you please explain? Okay. Uh, with uh, <coughs> uh, giving, it is said that a person should give with their two hands. Yeah. In other in other places, it is said that uh, anonymous giving is best. Okay. Giving <coughs> with two hands means uh, your right hand knows what left hand does. That means you give things uh, uh, and at the same time you need the publicity. And you want others to know that you give. Uh, and the other is giving anonymously. Uh, that means you do it quietly uh, without uh, expecting others to uh, recognize it, uh, without expecting even thanks from the recipients or other people uh, in order to reduce your own desire or greed uh, for the things that you give away. You give it quietly. That is called giving an, uh, anonymously. I think that is better than uh, uh, giving with the intention of uh, uh, other, with the publicity or with uh, a string attached. Um, anonymous giving is far better. Yes. What state of mind should one have when one gives? Does the Buddha give explanation on how to give, uh, to give a gift to somebody? What attitude should one have? Uh, what attitudes one should have? Yes, when one, when one gives something. It's not in the chat, Bante. When one gives something, what should have, what should one's state of mind be? Mind, yeah, when one gives something to somebody, one should not expect anything in return. Anything in return. That is the kind of attitude one should have when somebody gives some, something to someone. Uh, some organization or a, pl a person or, uh, you know, giving something to a person or to an organization, a charitable organization. Uh, sometimes hospitals, uh, monasteries, churches, and so forth. When they give, uh, they should have this attitude of not expecting, not getting anything in return. That is a very, very good selfless giving. That has more benefit. So would you say this helps overcome greed? Right, in order to overcome greed. Thank you, Bhante. The next question is, as a lay person, is it beneficial to have desire or passion to achieve success or positive outcomes in life? Or is it better not to have any desire at all? I think the best is not to have any desire, but it is not uh, uh, easy for a lay person to practice uh, 
because lay people have to earn their living, but when they earn their living righteously, honestly, sincerely, uh, they have a certain amount of desire, but they are not greedy, and not uh, very, I mean, going out of their way to gain more and more and more, sacrificing all the uh, comfort, peace, sleep, and so forth. Every, even the family, they keep earning, earning, earning. That is very uh, dangerous. But if somebody has a uh, uh, desire to earn enough for him and for his family and live moderately, uh, they have plenty of time to practice meditation and so forth. And therefore, that kind of desire is uh, not very dangerous. Uh, and eventually the person, this person uh, will be able to uh, reduce that desire. That kind of training is a very good uh, so that the person eventually will be able to get rid of all desires that cause our suffering. And that would be very good. And for for training the mind in that direction, uh, one uh, should have uh, contentment and uh, prioritize the needs in his life and then what is necessary, what is not necessary. Uh, and, you know, then uh, practice in in his, in his whole life, entire life, then one day the person will be able to let go of everything, including the attachment to the body. So uh, that is very high state of achievement. Uh, so we build up the momentum slowly and gradually to attain that state. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. The next question is um, In trying to understand the fetter of personality view, I find it confusing to distinguish between the various aspects of wrong view of self that one can take. Can you please explain, giving any concrete examples? Or similarly, the following distinction that we read in the sutta. So believing that the five aggregates of body, that is form, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness, are with self. That self is in the aggregate. That the aggregates are in self. That the aggregates are identical to self. So we have these five distinctions. Can you please clarify what these are with some examples. Okay, this is a very <laughs> long question. Yes. Mm. Uh, normally, uh, yes, this is the way how people uh, try to uh, associate with uh, the self, with the body. Uh, not only body, but uh, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. Uh, they think in these five ways, uh, four ways on each of them. That is how we, one has, one will have uh, uh, 20 types of personality view. Uh, personality view is uh, one thing, the aggregates are another. Aggregates themselves don't have any kind of uh, uh, in individuality or person or self. In any in any aggregate doesn't have self. For instance, uh, the aggregates all are uh, form aggregate is uh, made up of elements. Uh, Earth, air, yeah, water, fire, elements, uh, space, element, uh, consciousness, with six elements. Uh, the body is made up of mainly four elements. 
and then uh, there is no self in any of these elements. They are constantly, continuously, invariably changing all the time. The notion of self is associated with something permanent, eternal, uh, immutable, unchangeable. There is no such thing uh, in anywhere, any part of the universe, and uh, let alone the uh, body. Uh, you know, similarly, uh, feeling. When you have pleasant feeling, that time you don't have painful feeling or neutral feeling. You have only pleasant feeling. When you have uh, unpleasant feeling, that time you don't have pleasant feeling or neutral feeling. You just have unpleasant feeling. When you have a neutral feeling, you don't have pleasant feeling or unpleasant feeling. At that time you have you will have only a neutral feeling. Now, when pleasant feeling uh, is permanent, there is no room for unpleasant feeling or neutral feeling to arise. Therefore, pleasant feeling is impermanent. When pleasant feeling is impermanent, if you believe the feeling is self, or self is in the feeling, feeling and self are identical, feeling and self are different, and so on, the, the, if uh, a pleasant feeling changes, your self changes. When unpleasant feeling changes, your self changes. When neutral feeling changes, your self changes. Your assumption at the beginning is the self is something permanent. If you associate the self with the feeling, then how can that permanent self stays when the pleasant feeling changes, disappears? It disappears along with the pleasant feeling. And therefore, uh, what the Buddha said is 100% true, uh, that uh, uh, no, there is no anything permanent uh, to call self. Okay. Um, thank you, Bhante. Uh, I don't see another um, question. Uh, in the chat, but I wanted to ask, um, how does one develop patience in the practice? What's your advice to be patient in our practice of Dhamma? Patient? Yeah, to, to develop patience in practice. Right. I think uh, the developing patience uh, we have to uh, understand the danger of uh, danger of uh, impatience uh, when we are not uh, uh, practicing patience. We have we make uh, very uh, uh, wrong decisions. Uh, quick decisions uh, that always, always leads to danger, uh, trouble, uh, problems. And therefore, we have to practice patience uh, so that we can avoid dangerous consequences. Uh, that is by seeing this in one's own life, one must train oneself to be patient. It doesn't come very often, very quickly, but through uh, several experiences, uh, as we are mature, we grow, seeing the, uh, the problem we encountered when we were un impatient, in our life, in the past, we must have had must have had many 
such situations where we were not patients and uh, got into trouble. <clears throat> so from those previous experiences in this very life, we have to train ourselves not to uh, lose our temper. The <clears throat> Buddha said, uh, I think I mentioned this in several times, in, at several places, Yove upatitam kodham ratam bhantam dharaye tamahang sarathim brume rasmigao itaro janop in Pali. One who can stop his uh, raging anger abruptly, very quickly, like a horse driver, uh, the driver who rides a, a cart pulled by a horse, if that driver can stop the first running horse very quickly, that is a real driver. Others are just rain holders, Buddha said. Similarly, if somebody can stop the very dangerous, very powerful anger very quickly, that is a real hero. That is a real, the, the strongest person. So it is not a physical strength that can stop this, but the mental strength. So <clears throat> we can train ourselves through our, from our own experience. Secondly, we train ourselves from practicing mindfulness. And then thirdly, we can practice it, train ourselves through the practice of metta, loving friendliness, compassion, and above all, understanding is the number one of all remedies. So we immediately stop our uh, losing temper and then uh, practice mindfulness practice metta, and then we can see the benefit of that. Uh, our anger slowly subsides, our hatred subsides, fear and all this subsides, and then we experience a tremendous calm and peaceful mental state, inexpressibly calm and peaceful. Anytime we lost our temper, we always regret later on. And Buddha repeatedly mentioned, don't do anything that makes you regretful later on, that you regret. And uh, you know, experience the results with tearful eyes, tearful uh, face. And so, these are the kind of advices the Buddha has given, and uh, we keep practicing them again and again, reminding ourselves again and again, uh, in order to reduce our uh, quick temper and practice patience. Okay, friends, I think this is all I can do today uh, within this uh, limited time. And we do a meditation now, and uh, we are about maybe about twenty minutes. We can meditate, okay? Okay. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, 
living near or far, born or coming to birth, may all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere. Neither from anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another. As a mother who risks her own life to protect her only child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless loving friendliness, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hatred or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or when you awake. One should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision. Removing desire for sensual pleasures, one comes there again to birth in the womb. <laughs> With this metta thought, let us practice meditation. We have very short time and instructions are the same and we let us practice.
By means of this meritorious deed, may I never join with the foolish, may I join always with the wise, until the time I attain Nibbana. May the suffering be free from suffering, may the fear struck be free from fear, may the grieving be free from grief, so too may all beings be. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest, May all beings arisen in these realms, with form and without form, with perception and without perception, be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So friends, this is the end of today's uh, session. And those who like to join me in the afternoon at three o'clock, may join so and uh, to discuss one stanza from the Dhammapada. Uh, now I want to end this session with my regular metta wish. May all those who are in hospitals suffering from various diseases, may they recover very soon, practice Dhamma, and liberate themselves from samsaric suffering. May all the doctors, nurses, hospital staff who take care of these people, risking their life, comforting their, sacrificing their comfort, also find time to practice Dhamma, practice meditation, and liberate themselves from samsaric suffering. Those who have lost their loved ones Find some time to understand Dhamma, practice meditation, and overcome their grief and liberate themselves from samsaric suffering. May all those who are in trouble sports in various parts of the world, discrimination, poverty stricken area, um, war zones, May they all find peace. May all those cause problem, trouble in the world understand the nature of life, the karma they commit, and then try to practice Dhamma, meditate, liberate themselves from samsaric suffering. And all those who are in the northern direction be well, happy, and peaceful. Those who are in northeastern direction, be well, happy, and peaceful. Those who are in the eastern direction, be well, happy, and peaceful. Those who are southeastern direction, be well, happy, and peaceful. Those who are in the southern direction, be well, happy, and peaceful. Those who are in the southwestern direction, be well, happy, and peaceful. Those who are in the western direction, be well, happy, and peaceful. Those who are northwestern direction, be well, happy, and peaceful. All those who are up above us, be well, happy, and peaceful. Those who are below us, be well, happy, and peaceful. Thus all beings in ten different directions be well, happy, and peaceful. This is a very wonderful, soothing, comforting, altruistic thought that we cultivate in our mind and wish all of them be happy and peaceful. And all of us be well, happy, and peaceful. And that is the end of today's Dhamma this morning's Dhamma discussion and see you most of you next Saturday uh, 22nd and 23rd okay bye everyone sir nai bante thank you bante thank you bante Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.